Dear heads of states and governments, Mr. Secretary General, distinguished delegates, on behalf of myself, my country, and my nation, I greet you with my most heartfelt feelings and respect. I'm honored to have the opportunity to address the United Nations General Assembly once again today. Well, I hope that the 79th General Assembly will be a blessing for our countries and for the entire humanity. I would like to congratulate Mr. Francis on the completion of his term as President of the General Assembly and wish success to Mr. Young as he takes over. I would like to express here our pleasure to see the representative of our friend and brother Palestine in his rightful place among the member states as a result of long struggles. I hope that this historic step will be the final turning point on the road leading to Palestine's membership to the United Nations. The international community and all of us in the human family must fulfill our obligation to the Palestinian people without further ado, that haven't done already. Distinguished guests, I know that there are certain crises that you're monitoring on TV and those are the crises that we are going through every day and we're trying to manage them. That's why today I'm not talking, representing a country that is situated far away from tensions, but instead that is found at the very heart of tension and war. Some people will, critical, will be critical of us, but despite that fact, today on the common rostrum of the human race, we will speak of the truth frankly and openly. Right now, the United Nations, under the roof of which we are found today, were established in the aftermath of the Second World War, in which millions of people have lost their lives to maintain international peace and security. With the establishment of the United Nations, expectations for global stability, peace and justice were reborn, and hopes for peace were sprouted again. To put it bluntly, unfortunately, in the last few years, the United Nations has failed to fulfill its founding mission and has gradually become a dysfunctional structure. The world is bigger than five is my motto, it's my credo, and this credo represents our common values and we need those values more than ever in this day and age. International justice cannot be left in the will of five privileged mem member states of the Security Council. And the most dramatic example to that is the war, the massacre that has been going on in Gaza for the last 350 days. And since October 7, 41,000 Palestinians have been killed in the, con in the continuous Israeli attacks. 41,000 lives, 41,000 people, mostly children and women, were ruthlessly taken away. And no one knows where more than 10,000 people are, most of which are children. And likewise, 100,000 people were injured, maimed, or they lost their limbs. 172 journalists were killed while trying to do their job under very difficult circumstances. And more than 500 medics have been killed while they were trying to save lives. Humanitarian aid workers and the United Nations personnel who came to the rescue of the people of Gaza who were struggling with hunger and thirst were killed. More than 215 United Nations personnel. They hit marketplaces, tents, and camps where the refugees were sheltered. They hit 820 mosques and three churches that shouldn't have been touched even in war. And they deliberately hit dozens of hospitals, hundreds of schools, more than 130 ambulances carrying patients. 
they shredded the charter of the United Nations from the rostrum of the United Nations and shamelessly challenged the whole world, who are people of conscience, from this very rostrum. They challenged them. My friends, Leaked images from Israel's prisons, which it has turned into concentration camps, clearly show what kind of barbarian, barbarianism we are facing. As a result of Israeli attacks, Gaza has become the world's largest cemetery for women and children. More than 17,000 children were targeted by Israeli bullets and bombs. Hind Rajab was only six years old. He and his family were seeking safety when their car was hit by Israeli forces. He lost everything. He lost his mother, father, siblings, cousins. He lost all the hopes he had packed. And only he survived. He waited desperately for rescue for 12 years days. Will you come to take me? I'm fearful. Was, was waiting for a helping hand to reach out to him for 12 days. Despite the level of our world has reached, despite the technology at our disposal, despite our organizations with huge budgets employing tens of thousands of personnel as a human family, of 8 billion inhabitants, we haven't yet managed to rescue a six-year-old girl, which is actually like an injured sparrow trapped under the rubble that was shaking before our eyes. Hundreds of Gazan children died and are still dying because they cannot find a morsel of a dry bread, a sip of water, and a bowl of so soup. In Gaza, not only children are dying, but also the United Nations system. The values that the West claims to defend are dying. The truth is dying. The hopes of humanity to live in a more just world are dying one by one. I am asking you bluntly here, openly, frankly, I call out to you, oh, human rights organizations, are those in Gaza and the West Bank not human beings? Do children in Palestine have no rights? Can't they play out on the streets in their homelands safely? And calling out to the international press organizations, aren't the journalists murdered by Israel, Israel on live TV your colleagues whose offices were actually raided as well? I call out to United Nations Security Council what are you waiting for to prevent the genocide in Gaza to put a stop to this cruelty, this barbarianism? What are you waiting for to stop Netanyahu and his network? Who is endangering the lives of the Palestinian people, which is a part of a mass murder network? And what are you still waiting for to stop them? putting to danger their own people and the entire region for political gain. I would like to call out to the countries supporting Israel in an unconditional manner. How long are you going to be able to carry the shame of witnessing this massacre? Dear friends, while children are dying in Gaza, in Ramallah, in Lebanon, while babies are dying in incubators, unfortunately, the international community has given a very bad test and failed in a big way. What's happening in Palestine, look, is a sign of a great moral collapse. I believe that the peoples of the world, the leaders of countries and international organizations should reflect on this painful picture upon this painful landscape. And I would like to state very clearly and loudly here, the Israeli government disregarding basic human rights 
trampling on international law at every opportunity? Is practicing ethnic cleansing a clear genocide against a nation, a people, and occupying their lands step by step? Palestinians whose freedom, independence, and most basic rights have been usurped are rightfully exercising their legitimate rights of resistance against this occupation and ethnic cleansing. The just resistance of the Palestinian people against the occupiers of their land is too noble. It's honorable and legitimate to be called illegitimate. It's heroic and it's noble. The, the only reason for Israel's aggression against the Palestinian people is the unconditional support of group of countries. And I would like to wave at my brothers and sisters at the legitimate resistance in Palestine. As I've said before, the support of a group of countries for Israel is the reason why this aggression is still going on. Countries that have a say over Israel are openly complicit in this massacre with a policy of run for the hare and catch the hound. Those who are supposedly working for a ceasefire in front of the stage continue to send arms and ammunition to Israel so that it can continue its massacres in the background. This inconsistency and this is ins insincerity Look, there's a paper that has been going around back and forth since May. Hamas has repeatedly declared its acceptance of the ceasefire offer. But the Israeli government has made it very clear that this is the party that doesn't want peace by constantly dragging its feet, making a settlement of the dispute much more difficult, almost impossible, constantly finding an excuse and sneakily killing its negotiating partner at a time when it was closest to a ceasefire. Israel's stalling and deception should not be given any more credit. In the absence of the implementation, in the absence of the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution Number 2735, coercive measures against Israel should be put on the agenda. Israel's behavior has once again demonstrated that it is imperative for the international community to develop a protection mechanism for Palestinian civilians. Seventy years ago, just as Hitler was stopped by an alliance of humanity, Netanyahu and his murder network must be stopped, must be stopped by an alliance of humanity. We believe that the General Assembly's authority to recommend the use of force, as in the 1950 Resolution on Unity for Peace, should be considered in this process during this time. An immediate and a permanent ceasefire must be established. Hostages and prisoners must be exchanged. And humanitarian aid must be delivered to Gaza unhindered and uninterrupted. It's very, very important that we extend a helping hand to the people of Gaza, especially before the winter season when conditions on the ground will become even more challenging. Look, right now, 70% of the water supplies and 75% of the bakeries in Gaza have been destroyed. 95% of health centers were partially or completely damaged. 
150,000 houses were completely destroyed, 200,000 houses were partially destroyed, and 80,000 houses become uninhabitable. Infectious diseases such as polio and hepatitis are on the rise. The people of Gaza receive only a quarter of the aid they urgently need. That's what they have access to. And as Turkey, Turkey, we have been providing humanitarian aid to our brothers and sisters in Palestine, and we will keep on doing that. With more than 60,000 tons of aid, Turkey is the country sending the largest amount of aid to Gaza. Likewise, by halting commercial transactions with Israel, we have demonstrated our stance on this issue. Now, during the last uh, couple of weeks, attacks by Israel have been uh, increased in Lebanon, and we are by the side of Lebanese people and the Lebanese government. We can see this truth for what it is. Those who murdered 41,000 people cannot rest until those who gave the orders, pulled the trigger, and dropped the bombs are held accountable for their crimes. We will not heave a sigh of relief. Our conscience will not go silent. The bill for the billions of dollars of damage caused in the cities that have been destroyed, wrecked, and reduced to rubble must and will be compensated by the perpetrators. We support the case brought by the Republic of South Africa at the International Court of Justice to ensure that Israel's crimes do not go unpunished. We will take every step necessary for justice to be served in the case for which we have applied as an intervener or as a party. We will fight for the blood of Aisha Nur Ezgi Eigi, who was shot in the head and murdered by Israeli soldiers during a peaceful protest in Nablus. And we will fight in all legal remedies, and we will keep on doing that. While a ceasefire in Gaza is urgently needed, the underlying problem in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. Based on the 1967 borders, an independent, sovereign, and geographically integrated Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital must come into being. This cannot be delayed any longer. I would like it to be known that we are closely following Israel's increasing attacks on our first Qibla, Al-Aqsa Mosque and Haram al-Sharif. I, I would like to state once again on this podium as Taib Erdogan once again that I'm not using a language of politics. I am encouraged by our ancestors who have always stood by the side of the victims honorably and nobly. We are a nation that has been on the side of the oppressed and against the oppressors and oppression throughout history. We are such a nation. We welcomed Jews fleeing the Inquisition 500 years ago and Jews fleeing Hitler's concentration camps. We opened our arms wide. We, as a country and a nation, I'll be very clear to say that we have no animosity or hostility towards the people of Israel. We oppose anti-Semitism in the same way we oppose the targeting of Muslims just because of their faith. Our problem is with the massacre policies of the Israeli government. Our problem is with the oppressor 
and the oppression just as it was five centuries ago. Everybody should know about this. We will always speak of the truth and speak of what's right and what's fair. Even if some people will be uncomfortable, we will continue to sh shout out the truth and stand by the righteous and boldly say that we will speak of what we know is right, even though it will hurt some people. From here, I would like to thank all the courageous people who show solidarity with the Palestinian people without discrimination of faith, country, language or religion and who take to the streets almost every week to raise their voices against the massacres in Gaza. I would like to especially thank the university students and the youth. Distinguished delegates, Unfortunately, in the 14th year of the conflict, Syria is still far from stability. The economic and humanitarian situation in the country, in the grip of terrorism and separatist organizations, remains dire. On the basis of UN Security Council Resolution 2254, we hope to advance the political process and achieve national reconciliation. We are determined to sincerely pursue our position in favor of a realistic dialogue. We are very sincere in that regard. Our neighbor Iraq, while continuing its fight against terrorism, is taking decisive steps towards development, reconstruction and reintegration with its region. And the international community must support Iraq's efforts. In this context, it is important to implement initiatives such as the Development Road Project, which will benefit the entire region on a win-win basis. The success of all these efforts depend on the complete elimination of the terrorist threat in Iraq, in particular the PKK. We are strengthening our common action plan with another neighbor of ours, Iran, in the region in order to establish stability and peace. It's going to contribute tremendously to our efforts. The war in Ukraine has been going on for three years and we are still away from establishing a permanent peace and stability. As the arms race accelerates, the space for diplomacy is shrinking. It's very important that diplomacy and dialogue will ensure territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and our support for those endeavors of Turkey will continue even strongly. And again, during this process, we are determined to uh, implement the Montreux, Montreux Convention on the Straits. We will rigorously implement the Montreux Convention. We support the peace process between Azerbaijan and Armenia and hope that this process will be concluded as soon as possible with good news. We support continued high-level contacts between the two countries. And we are focusing on dialogue. Turkey and Armenia we are also taking positive steps on that track too. Progress in the Azerbaijan-Armenia peace process will have a positive impact on the Turkey-Armenia normalization process. Dear friends, we play a constructive role for the prosperity and peace at the Balkans, of which we are an integral part, and we act in close cooperation with all actors in the region. As a member of the Steering Committee for Peace Implementation Council, we emphasize the importance of the sovereignty, political unity and territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina on every platform and continue our contribution to Operation Eufor Altea. We are successfully continuing the key four command we assumed last year and supporting the Belgrade-Pristina dialogue process. We want to see the Aegean Sea 
and the Eastern Mediterranean as a zone of stability and prosperity where the legitimate interests of all the parties are concerned can be respected. It is in the common interest of the entire region to enhance cooperation, particularly on the delimitation of maritime jurisdictions in accordance with international law, freedom and safety of nav navigation and maritime trade. International maritime law encourages cooperation between littoral states in closed or semi-closed seas, such as the Aegean Sea. Turkey is ready for constructive cooperation on all issues, especially in energy and environment. We have the longest coastline in the eastern Mediterranean, and Turkey's key role is undeniable. Turkey has legitimate rights and authorities in the western part of the island of Cyprus, while the Turkish Cypriots have legitimate rights in the areas around the world. It has been 50 years since the Cyprus peace operation and 61 years since the Cyprus issue emerged as a result of the Greek Cypriot usurpation of the partnership state. From that day until today, peace and tranquility have prevailed on the island. It was always the Turkish Cypriots and Turkey who put forth the sincere will to bring about a just, lasting and sustainable solution to the Cyprus issue. <clears throat> the Federation model is now completely outdated. And we fully support the vision of a two-state solution with two different nations put forward by the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. The sovereign equality and equal international stat status of the Turkish Cypriots, which are the vested rights of the Turkish Cypriots, must be re-registered and the isolation must end. <clears throat> Today, I once again invite the international community to recognize the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus and to establish diplomatic, political and economic relations. We actively support the stabilization of Libya and the preservation of the unity and integrity of the country. We call on all states to sincerely stand by Libya at this very sensitive time and contribute to building trust between the parties. We must do more to end the conflict in Sudan. We all have a responsibility to deliver humanitarian assistance to the millions of Sudanese people displaced by the conflict. With its young and dynamic population, rich natural resources and vast fertile lands, Africa has enormous potential. <clears throat> Based on the principles of equal partnership and mutual respect, hand in hand with the peoples of Africa, we support the continent's efforts for peace, stability and development. We will continue to stand in full solidarity with our African brothers and sisters. <clears throat> As part of our initiatives, we are strengthening our deep-rooted ties with Asia. We are deepening our engagement with our partner regional organizations such as ASEAN, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the Pacific Islands Forum. We keep our will to develop our relations with BRICS, which brings together emerging economies alive. We share a deep-rooted history with the countries of Central Asia, and we are further strengthening our cooperation on bilateral and multilateral grounds. Our organization of Turkic states is gradually turning into a center of attraction. The organization is becoming an exemplary model of cooperation with the contributions of observer members Hungary and the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. We will further strengthen our unity and our togetherness as the Turkic world. And 
Within the framework of respect for China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, we are in close dialogue with China to protect the fundamental rights and freedoms of Uyghur Turks, Turks with whom we have strong historical, cultural and humanitarian ties. <clears throat> we endeavor to build on the friendly ties we have established with the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. Distinguished delegates, we must work together to address global injustice. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals concept of leaving no one behind is a guiding principle for these efforts. As one of the largest aid donors relative to its uh, gross domestic product, Turkey's development cooperation activities contribute to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. We contribute to efforts to ensure fair, inclusive growth and development in all international platforms, especially the G20, of which we are a member. We approach technological breakthroughs not as a source of new injustice and conflicts, but as a source of a more prosperous future, such as AI. We believe that all nations should equally benefit from the transformative power of these uh, breakthrough technologies. The United Nations Technology Bank for Least Developed Countries, which we are hosting, is a concrete manifestation of our efforts in this direction. But unfortunately, the cyber terror attacks that took place in Lebanon last week show us once again how deadly these technologies can be used as weapons. I, I approach the climate change issue from that same perspective. No country can tackle emission reductions and climate change adaptation alone. The most important issues for developing countries are financing, technology transfer, and capacity building. I sincerely believe that the COP29 climate summit in Baku will contribute to the solution of these issues. At the summit, we expect to launch important additional initiatives and unveil our long-term low emission development strategy and the uh, zero waste initiative that w became a reality under the auspices of my spouse, Madam Emine Erdogan. And with mutual agreements, we have taken our uh, domestic affairs and initiatives to international agendas. I would like to ask everybody to uh, support our endeavors in that regard. We see Islamophobia, xenophobia, and racism creeping over the world like a poison ivy. We can see that every week uh, attacks are taking place upon our mosques and our holy book of Quran. In the middle of Europe, People's homes are set on fire and lives are taken because of their ethnic and religious affiliation. Their lives are taken away from them and their fundamental rights are being suspended. And nobody can ignore this growing danger any longer. On March 15, 2024, we expect a special envoy to combat Islamophobia to be appointed at the United Nations as soon as possible, as envisaged in the draft resolution adopted on March the 15th. Today, I would like to draw your attention once again to the danger that I raised last year on this podium. Attacks on the institution of family, the pillar of society, are increasing. The disgrace staged at the opening of the 2024 Olympic Games has revealed the extent of the threat we face as humanity.
a sporting event watched by innocent children and hundreds of millions of people of all ages and beliefs has been used as a tool for a sexist propaganda. It was actually a, par a parade of bad scenes. Those disturbing scenes of evil have wounded not only the Catholic world, the Christian world, but everyone who respects the sacred values. The issue of desexualization is no longer an orientation, but a global imposition. It, be it literally became a war against the sacred and mm, human nature. We are facing a multidimensional, comprehensive, and ruthless project of destruction who are speaking out and who are reacting to this evil. Anyone who raises a voice for this annihilation uh, project is silenced and targeted by lynch campaigns. And Turkey is determined to break this siege and resist the climate of fear. To this end, we became a member of the United Nations Friends of the Family Group. Inshallah, God willing, Together with other member countries, we will not hesitate to defend the family, the human being, and the human nature. I invite all the countries that share our sentiments to shoulder this struggle. With these thoughts in mind, I wish that the 79th General Assembly will be auspicious for all humanity. I greet you all once again with love and respect. May peace be with you and may you remain in health. If you like this video, then like, share, and subscribe to ET Now.